Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer and my guest today is Richard Lang. Richard attended a workshop in 1970 with the author of um, The Headless Way, Douglas Harding, and by doing Harding's experiments was astonished to find he, that he saw his true self. He was so impressed with the effectiveness of the experiments that he became involved in the work of sharing this method with as many people as possible. And um, when I was listening to Richard's interviews and talks in preparation for this and reading his book, I was reminded of a song by the Incredible String Band, uh, which for some reason is called Douglas Trahern Harding, the name of the song. But Harding's middle name was Edison, wasn't it? Yes, that's why did right. They, why did they call it Trahern? Because Thomas Trahern is a well-known English mystic uh, mm -hmm. from the sort of 17th century. And he spoke a lot about having a single eye and being capacity for the world. I see. And uh, Mike Heron of the string band was reading Traherne, knew Traherne. And uh, actually, Traherne was very uh, a favorite of Douglas's. So oh, cool. it was a good choice. They it, just it blended combined, it together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Combined Traherne and Douglas, really. Cool. Yes. I'd actually like to read a few lyrics from that song. Um, one of which I sometimes use as my little blurb on Skype. You know, you have you can put a little message there. Uh, the, the the song starts out: When I was born, I had no head. My eye was single, and my body was filled with light. And the light that I was was the light that I saw by. And the light that I saw by was the light that I was. And then there's a bunch more in the song. And then there's a refrain: One light, the light that is one, though the lamps be many, which is the little thing I sometimes use on Skype. And then it ends up. You never, you never enjoy the world aright till the sea floweth, till the sea itself floweth in your vein, and you are clothed with the heavens and crowned with the stars. Yes, that last bit is Traherne. Ah, nice. Yes. So, for those of you listening who have never heard of the Incredible String Band, check them out. They were one of the highlights of the late '60s, early '70s. Douglas met them in the late '60s in York, in the north of England, and. Mm -hmm showed Mike Heron the, uh, that he was headless and uh, they became friends and Douglas went to see them perform at the Royal Albert Hall a couple of times. Cool. <clears throat> so when I first heard of headlessness, uh, you know, a few years ago, I probably had this sort of reaction that many people had, which is, you know, of course I have a head. If I didn't have a head, I'd be dead, you know. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean I don't have one. I mean, I can't see my liver either, but I'm reasonably confident that I have one. Otherwise, again, I'd be dead. So uh, maybe some people have that knee-jerk reaction. So let's take plenty of time and, and, and really explain to us why it's called headlessness, what the whole thing is, what your experience with it is. We'll, we'll take a couple hours and really unpack this. Lovely. Well, I just want to say thank you, Rick, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, into this interview. So, great. I'm very glad to be here. Sure. I'm glad to share the headless way. And you know, quite a few listeners also wanted me to invite you, which is one of the criteria I use for inviting people. It's like, let's, you know, uh, they kept writing in saying, get this guy on. So, here we are. <clears throat> great. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's called the headless way because, uh, well, this, the basic question, uh, obviously, really, is who am I? What am I? And one takes a fresh look at what one actually experiences of oneself. So before we go into all that it might mean and whether it's true or not, one just notices the plain neutral experience, which is you can't see your head. Mm -hmm. Now we can debate whether we've got one or not, but you, I don't think you can argue against the fact you can't see it uh, in the place you're looking out of. You can see it. Uh, in the mirror and in photographs and so on. And so, uh, of course, I can see a bit of my nose, but from my point of view, it's vanishing into nothing. And I am convinced it's the same for everyone. And if I do this, my hands disappear and then reappear. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah? Yeah, people can try these experiments while they're watching. Yes, yeah. that's the point, really, is, is do the experiment, viewer, and notice your hands disappear. And... Uh, so this is the basic experience, and uh, it's non-verbal and non-emotional. I, I, I don't need to understand this in any particular way to notice it. I'm just noticing, I can't see my eyes now, I can't see anything right here. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to feel good, or uh, I don't have to understand it in any way to actually experience it. But of course, if, and then the, 
Douglas developed lots of experiments for testing this point of view out, whether it's true or not. You know, it's not just can you see your head, but what happens when you turn around? Uh, well, you don't see you moving, you see the scenery moving. Mm. Or if I'm looking at you now, Rick, I see your face, not mine. Uh, so we call that face to no face. So that's the uh, the first introduction to the non-verbal, non-emotional experience, which doesn't sound very attractive, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and as I recall, Douglas first stumbled upon this. He was a spiritual seeker. He was hiking in the Himalayas, and 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 all of a sudden he kind of popped into this realization. That isn't quite true, actually. All right, straighten us uh, out. It was a write-up uh, on Having No Head, was written about 20 years or so after he first saw who he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, in brief, Douglas's story was that uh, he grew up in a fundamentalist Christian group, mm -hmm. left when he was 21, having had enough of being told what to think, and uh, began to work out his own view. And he first of all was influenced by the relativists, uh, relativity, and uh, in other words, what something is depends on how far away you are from it, mm. partly. You mean in so a scientific it, sense, like Einstein? Yes, yeah. that's right. I mean, in a very simple way, you're looking at me through the camera, so you see my face. Mm -hmm. But if you place the camera closer, you wouldn't see my face, you'd see a patch of skin. Mm -hmm. And if with uh, other instruments you could come closer, you'd see cells, and so on. And uh, on the other hand, if you went away from me, you'd see my whole body, and then England, and the planet, and the star, and so on. And so Douglas began to realize that he wasn't just human, that he had layers. In fact, I'll probably show this several times, but this is a model he made uh, in the 70s of the layers of his being. Cool. And it's, uh, yes, it's fantastic. So this represents what you are at zero distance, this nothingness. Uh -huh. And on the outside are what you appear to be at different ranges. So at this range, can you see that? Yeah. Uh, there's a person. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're through the camera, you're viewing me at that range. But if you come up to me, you'd find cells and molecules and mm -hmm. particles and so on. But if you went away from me, then you'd find the the rest of humanity and the planet and the star and the galaxy, right? Yeah, neat. That's yes. a great model. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's uh, our body-mind in one map. Yeah. So, so I'll probably come back to that in a moment. But now, of course, some people might say, yeah, that's fine. That's the, that's the molecules and that's in zooming out. That's the galaxy. But that's not me. Me is that, you know, third or fourth little thing that you swung out there, which is that guy standing there. That's the me. Everything else is kind of the non-me. Just to play devil's that advocate. That is the normal view, right. yes. <laughs> but uh, when Douglas looked into it objectively, he, he realized that the, that normal me, which we identify with, and quite rightly so, the one we see in the mirror, it is uh, nonsense without all the other layers. Mm -hmm. You see, I can't breathe without my lungs, or the cells that make up my lungs, or the molecules that make up my cells, or the atmosphere of my planet, mm -hmm. or the warmth and light of my star. And so, uh, the whole thing is one living system. Now, what uh, Douglas realized was the question, who am I, is not just what I, I am in appearance or in body, which is absolutely vital, but who is at the center of all these layers. And the nearer you get, the less there is, you see. And he was well aware. This is in the 1940s now, or late 30s. He had uh, left England in 1937, got married, went to India, to work there as an architect. He was an architect, got a job there. The war broke out. His wife and kids went back, went to America, actually. And, but he was intensely involved with this question, who am I? And uh, working on it and working on uh, this idea of layers and not just body, but mind as well. And he was deeply convinced that at the center there was what you might call nothing. And all the great religions talk about this, but he, he, it was more of an idea as much as anything. Until one day, in 1942 or three, he saw a picture by Ernst Mark in a book he was reading on philosophy. And this was a self-portrait by Ernst Mark was an early relativist and 
scientists. And uh, when you talk of speeds, Mark V, that was the mark. Oh, Ernst Mark. Mark. Hmm. Yes. And so uh, Ernst Mark, in this book uh, uh, that Douglas was reading, decided to go back to the beginning and j just uh, describe his direct experience before he verbalized. And he drew a picture of himself, which is a headless body with an arm reaching out to the, the uh, piece of paper he was drawing on and the room beyond. And a big nose, you see, if you look close one <laughs> eye, your nose goes from the ceiling to the floor. Uh -huh. And in this picture, uh, Ernst Mark's nose curls down from the ceiling to the floor. Well, when Douglas saw this, he uh, realized he was in the same condition. And that not, instead of just trying to penetrate into himself from outside, peeling away the layers, you know, to get to the center, this picture was a view from the center out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so although Douglas was really uh, already almost home, this picture uh, made very clear what home looked like. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was uh, 1942 or three. He then, he'd been working on this for 10 years. He wrote, uh, he'd wrote, already written two books unpublished. And he then worked on this during the rest of the war and then he got back to England in 1945 and he took five years off before going back to architecture to, because having seen that he was headless, that he, the center is visible so he'd been trying to penetrate to the center from outside. He knew, knew kind of what it was. But suddenly it was visible. He was looking out of it, this open, headless, clear space, full of everything. And it inspired him. And he realized that he needed to make sense of it in terms of modern science and philosophy. Hmm. And uh, so he said to his wife, look, I'm going to take a year off and finish this book. I've been working on it for, you know, three, four years plus. And uh, anyway, he, because he'd saved a bit of money, and he then, uh, after a year, he was nowhere near finishing. And it, it took until 1950, another five years, 14 hours a day, wow. seven days a week, no holidays. Amazing. That's the hierarchy yeah. of heaven and earth? Yes. Wow. Uh, a incredible, sustained achievement, attention and depth. And he went into every question. It is the most inspiring book. It, it's just... Uh, uh, he went back to the beginning and he draws on tradition, he read everyone, he stands on everyone's shoulders. And so that came out in 1950. So the, you were referring earlier to his description in On Having No Head, where he was walking in the mountains. Hmm. Well, he did walk in the mountains, he went up to the Himalayas. But that wasn't where he first saw it. When he first really saw it was looking at this picture in this book. But on having no head, he wrote in 1960-61, and he decided in order to attract the public, he would uh, kind of, um, you know, write it up a bit and say he was walking in the Himalayas, you know, when ah, he I see. saw it. But, <laughs> you know, it's, huh. yes. You, could, you don't have to be walking in the Himalayas too. But then, you see, what happened, then he got back into architecture, and then he continued writing. He realized he dis he felt he'd discovered something of it, just incredible importance. Yeah. And the first person who really recognized it, uh, the, the that book, was C.S. Lewis. He sent out the manuscript to lots of people. And eventually Lewis wrote back and said, um, I've never been so drunk with a book of philosophy for years and years and years. Who are you? Why haven't I heard of you? And C.S. Lewis wrote the preface and gave him a leg up. Uh, so, uh, but then um, he got back into architecture, wrote other things, and uh, with on having no head, he just discovered Zen and Ramana Maharshi, and visited the London Buddhist Society summer school in the late fifties, and that brought him out into contact with the Buddhists. And the Buddhist Society invited him to write this book, or publish this book anyway. And then from there he began to get better known. And in the, so in the late 60s when he met Mike Heron, that he was uh, sharing the headless 
uh, experience more and more. The first person he really shared it clearly with was a lady called Helen, who was actually his secretary in uh, his architecture practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got it and went head over heels with it. It was a very powerful he experience. Headless over heels, maybe. That's right, headless over here. <laughs> I know, it's full of potential fun. <laughs> so. And uh, I think that blew his mind because he hadn't, Lewis had understood the ideas, but when someone got it in such a powerful, emotional, intellectual way as Helen did, his thought at the time was, well, I can die now, I've shared it one, with one other person, mm. because it had been a lonely path, uh, aware of this most obvious thing. Hmm. Uh, and yet unable to share it. But then it, gradually more and more people began to say yes, and he developed his experiments along with friends in the late 60s and 70s. I met him in 1970, and uh, some of the experiments were, were, were developed then. And the experiments were really a breakthrough because they made it very easy to share. You know, one of them is you point out, and you can find that, uh, try this, you point out at objects in front of you and you just look at what you're pointing at mm -hmm. and notice in the simplest terms that you're pointing at something. It's got color and shape. Mm -hmm. And you point at your arm and you're pointing at something. But then you point at where others see your face. Well, you don't see your face. You don't see anything. I don't. And uh, you just see your finger. Well, you don't see a solid object here. And that is a direct experience. And um, so from the late 60s, uh, Douglas was making more and more friends and sharing this more and more widely and had an open house, uh, uh, inviting people, you know, if you were interested in this, I used to go every other weekend and made a whole load of friends. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is it's non-hierarchical because you can't be better at seeing nothing than someone else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me just interject a comment or two here. I, I've, I've tried a few of these experiments a little bit, and, you know, I've been on my own spiritual path for 40-odd years, but um, I found them very effective. Uh, for, I particularly like the one where you point and then you spin around. Oh, yes. And uh, I, I was out feed, putting b seeds in the bird feeder one morning, about 6 in the morning in my pajamas, spinning around. I don't think any of the neighbors saw me, but... <laughs> But uh, it was cool because, I mean, here is this absolute clarity and stillness unmoving, and, yeah. the, and then the world kind of turns around, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. But the nothing, that, that clarity and stillness doesn't move at all. It's just <laughs> solid as a rock. And yeah. uh, I listened to a lot, of, all, a lot of your interviews, all the ones you have on YouTube with various people, and uh, I just want to say that, you know, I, it's a very sincere, uh, intelligent, group of people that, I mean, I don't know what percentage of people who do these experiments actually get it. Maybe that's a hand-selected group, obviously, that you interviewed, and you'd interview some others who said, I don't know, it didn't work for me. But uh, obviously, these people had been profoundly impacted by it. And, um, you know, there was even one fellow who was, it was such a powerful experience that he was psychologically destabilized and had to be hospitalized for a day or two. And then Douglas kind of took him under his wing and and yeah. helped him out, um, which is not to say that this is dangerous, but which is to say that it's not just a mere sort of a mood or some, or some little mind trick. It, it can really rock your world if you get what you're talking about oh, yes. here. Yeah. Yes. Yes, all those people are uh, very good friends of mine, mm -hmm. uh, well, most of them, that I've known for more, you know, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really wanted to introduce people to friends of Douglas, more uh, mainly, who, for whom this uh, had been central in their lives for years and years. Uh, and also just to show that uh, how different the expressions are of this. Yeah. And uh, how everyone expresses it differently, and there isn't uh, a standard response. And, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, really delightful. Uh, uh, but... Uh, in terms of how many people get this, I don't know. It's so hard to tell. But uh, Douglas would say he'd shared it with thousands. He died seven years ago, but mm -hmm. uh, shared it with thousands and thousands. Of course, how many people actually value it is another thing. But I set up the charitable trust, the Sholem Trust, uh, nearly 20 years ago. We've got a website. Mm -hmm. And we've got all, the, as you know, the experiments on the website. And 
I regularly get emails saying, I've just been to your website, done the pointing experiment, I'm blown away. Yeah. I've been re reading all the books for years and years, and suddenly I know what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got the direct experience. So, yeah. And we, we have uh, free Skype meetings, and, and pe new pe some beautiful people have just turned up recently out of the blue. Uh, and the, we were saying this morning, we had a Skype meeting, meeting this morning, it's so delightful to meet new friends who are enjoying this. And you don't have the slightest feeling that you're doing it any better or than they are. It, once you, when you see it, as, as we are doing now, it, you see it perfectly. But you have your own unique expression and it's so interesting to enjoy different expressions of it. Yeah. Um, well, if you experience the bat gap bump, as many people I interview do, then you should have some new friends in your Skype meetings. Usually people get a pretty good response from doing these interviews. Wow. Um, and what we're talking about here, just to l let me state it and as well, just these experiments we're referring to are a bunch of things you can do, which point out to you or, or make you see things in a way you might not have been seeing them and make it kind of obvious who you are in, in an essential sense. And of course, this is what practically every spiritual practice is designed to do. And I never got this, any sense from Douglas or you that you are in any way um, putting down other spiritual practices. In fact, you yourself, after being with Douglas for, for quite a bit, went into a Buddhist uh, community and, and ardently practiced that, and also went into psychotherapy and, and ardently looked into that. Um, so this is not necessarily in lieu of other things or in conflict with other things, but it is, you know, you do assert that it's something new and something fresh and that it could perhaps be effective for people in ways that other things either haven't or that, you know, like for instance, Ramana Maharshi is always, you know, famous for, for advocating self-inquiry. This is, in a way, a, a, a kind of like a mechanical form of self-inquiry. Some, yes. some, some little techniques which actually could be a, an aid to self-inquiry, which uh, would be completely um, harmonious with, with Ramana Maharshi's intentions. Absolutely, Rick. Uh, and uh, Ramana Maharshi was a favorite of Douglas. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Douglas found lots of quotations in Ramana that, were, that he uh, felt very sympathetic about. Uh, but a simple one that comes to mind, which, which we found, was something like uh, uh, seeing who you are is staring into vacancy. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking into vacancy now. I'm looking out of vacancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this pointing is a powerful thing. Uh, you have to do it so the viewer can do it. But you point and you just look. And I see my finger. And then I don't see anything here. So I could, in words, say I'm pointing into vacancy. Mm -hmm. Now, if I point with the other finger out, you see, I'm pointing at fullness. Right. And uh, this is this Buddhist uh, idea as well, isn't it? Form is void and void is form. Well, the emptiness is full. And there's no dividing line between this emptiness and now Rick and our voices and sensations and everything. Mm. Yes, yeah, so uh, I... Uh, it doesn't uh, exclude any uh, genuine way. Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a non-verbal, non-emotional, I would say non-dogmatic experience. And then you express it in your way. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad I read, uh, I, I didn't read your entire book, but I read maybe the first half and then I read the whole last section where of interviews with you and with Douglas. And I'm glad I got to that part because you know, some people might have the impression when they hear you speak that, you know, you do a few experiments, you get it, you're done. Uh, and you, you made it clear that this is something you, uh, you know, continued to work at for many years and still continue to work at. And it's not just sort of a, you know, snap your fingers, you're finished kind of idea. Um, mm. And some people actually say that. I mean, you hear people saying, well, I, I had such and such an awakening, I'm done. And that always makes me laugh because I don't think anybody's done. <laughs> and and uh, yet, uh, go ahead. Well, rather sad if they are done. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I have a, there's a friend who's a Buddhist uh, monk, Amaranato, Samanera, 
and he was on our Skype this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an old friend. And I think I heard your interview with him. Yes, yeah. that's right. Well, Sam, who I did an interview with as well, mm -hmm. uh, mentioned something. Uh, he, he was in a meeting with um, Amarinato, and someone said, so what's the difference between awakening and mindfulness? You mm -hmm. see, And Sam passed it straight to Amarinato. And Amarinato said, well, awakening is seeing this, mindfulness is going on seeing this. Mm. And going on with it is, is the thing, isn't it? And uh, it, it, uh, if you go on with it, this simple, very humble gate of seeing into nothingness, you know, which, which doesn't really advertise itself, it's called the valley, isn't it? The, right at the bottom of everything. You, you stay with this and it brings you moment by moment gifts. I mean, this situation now where I am capacity for Rick and also capacity for two voices, both are in me now, and so as Richard, I've got this voice, and you've got that one as Rick. But as the one, this openness, this silence, both voices are mine. And uh, this is a, a different way of listening, it, just as it's a different way of seeing, everything is in you. Mm -hmm. So ongoing awareness of that is the, is the thing, yes. Yeah. You never enjoy the world aright till the sea itself floweth mm -hmm. in your vein and you are clothed with the heavens and crowned with the stars. I know, literally. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. You look out at the night sky and it's all in you. Hmm. I mean, I, it, it, when, if you see this and go on seeing this, if you don't spend half your time lying on your back trying to recover, <laughs> <laughs> I think... <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good point. Um, Going on with that, I presume you mean by that you mean uh, integrating, stabilizing, having it become richer and fuller, and and you know, yes. just more more continuous. Without, and I would say ultimately it should be a deal where you know you're not having to think about it or do little exercises or anything else. It's as natural as breathing. It's just oh, yes. the way you function. It's just the way you naturally perceive the world. Yes, I, I think the experiments are like. Uh, the directions to show you the door. Mm -hmm. Well, go through the door, step over the threshold. Don't stay at the threshold. Mm. Go in and enjoy the spaces indoors and, you know, live there. Um, but, uh, uh, the, uh, so the, not to get attached to the experiments, but my God, they are powerful. And uh, anyway, they're very practical. I mean, I'm noticing you know, when I bring my mind to it, that I only see Rick's face now, and I, well, I can see Richard's down there at the bottom of the screen. Skype window, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, 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 this picture is showing me what you look like at this range, and that one is showing me what I look like at this range. But I'm noticing that I have no appearance here, mm -hmm. and I'm room for you now. So we call that face to no face, if you like. Well, I don't have to think it. To, but I'm, you know, just it's just the way it is that I'm capacity for you now, mm -hmm. and not just for what I see, but what I feel and hear and sense. You know, it's very rich. So, uh, you know, and as you were saying, uh, movement. Well, we walk around. We could, you know, here we are noticing we're still, or we get in a car and the scenery moves, or you travel to another country, you don't go anywhere, it arrives in you. I mean, it, it is astonishing and fun and relaxing and true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking of some line from the Gita. It's, uh, know that to be indeed indestructible by which all this is pervaded. And, you know, that implies that all, all that we see is pervaded by being, by you know, this indestructible being. And that doesn't move. It's just the, the sort of surface appearances are moving. And, yeah. and we are that. So if we know ourselves to be that, then we don't move. The things, we pervade that which moves and, and things appear to move through us, but not we through them. And this is uh, verifiable here and now. Mm -hmm. You just pay attention. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you, I, I learned to meditate back in the 60s and still do it. And uh, I, you know, I, I and, and others whom I know who do, practiced it um, went through a lot of an, physiological change. In fact, it's still a, kind of about physiological change in a way because the nervous system has, has I mean, any experience we have uh, looking at a flower or anything, 
uh, there's some corresponding activity in the brain, in the nervous system, which enables us to have that experience. And if we're talking about a radical transformation of the, our, our experience of the world, then we are implying a radical transformation of the way the nervous system functions. And indeed, through you know, the practice of meditation, I, I've experienced that taking place over the years, you know, real sort of purging of of stuff that was occluding or clouding my ability to perceive and so on. So did you notice something similar with seeing? Did it kind of trigger uh, physiological transformation? Oh yes, and continues to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects one at every level. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't think one ever gets to the end of it, but it is profound, profoundly transformative. And um, one of the uh, indications of this is just direct experience. Uh, I, I'll just give a little resume, if I can, of, briefly, of the four stages. Oh, of yeah, that's growth. nice. Yeah, please. Yes, because then that will put in context some of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, there are four main stages the baby, the child, the adult, and the seer. So the baby, in these terms, is headless. You there you are, you're a space with the world, you don't, you look in the mirror, you don't identify with the face there, uh, and uh, you're open, built open, headless. And your feelings and thoughts, whatever they are, however developed, are kind of happening in the view, like your hand, you know, it's not yours, it's all going on. <laughs> right. Now you're pre-verbal, so you don't put a name on it, but there you are. This is highly infectious. Uh, if you're with a baby, it gives you permission to be headless. Mm -hmm. You're talking to an adult and then you turn back to the baby and ah, goo goo goo, you know, <laughs> and then you turn to... So the baby gives you that permission to be headless. So we all started in this uh, condition, which is actually the condition of the one, isn't it? Without knowing you're a little one, a person. You're the one space for the world. So uh, the second stage is the child. Now growing up, in these terms is learning to see yourself from outside. Understand you have an appearance and the mirror shows you what you look like so you learn to identify with the face in the mirror. You learn to identify with what others tell you you are. Uh, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're Richard, you're Rick, you're and so on. And uh, you're learning to get in this box that you see in the mirror. Now when you're a baby uh, your sensations are not localized your thoughts are not localized. Now growing up is learning to get in the box and kind of bring your thoughts into that box and your sensations and localize yourself. And uh, as a child you're learning to do this but quite a lot of the time you forget. And so you're half in the box and half not yet in. But you want to get in, you want to join in, it's, you can't function without that. And again, children, that state of consciousness is highly infectious and uh, go and play with the kids Richard oh yes please right you know I can play I can be creative I can make things up as I go along I I can be an airplane I can be a train mm -hmm. see I'm not fixed in one box yet mm -hmm. but as we grow up we learn to completely identify with the one in the mirror with what we look like and the mark of being a, a an adult is when you look in the mirror and just without thinking at all, just take that to be you. And in other words, you're going sort of outside and seeing yourself as other, others see you. And in that third stage of the adult, the idea of being headless is nonsense and stupid and mad. Of course I've got a head, I just can't see it, you see. And uh, headlessness is either stupid or childish. And so what you've done in the th by the third stage is you're the one, the emptiness, and you've now forgotten you're the one. You're not aware of being headless, being the one, this spacious openness. And you're identified with what you look like and acting as if you're Richard or Rick and so on. And you're separate now. And uh, so most people uh, think that that's what life is about. Life is about, growing up is about finding out who you are as a person, more or less taking responsibility for being that one and making the best of the cards you were dealt because you don't have much choice about, you don't have any choice about which one you were, <laughs> you became. So, 
But when the headless way is indicating that this is not uh, the end of the story, that the next stage of the story is reawakening to what's always been true, this openness. But now you have a profound understanding that you manifest as a separate person. And so uh, the idea that you, in order to be who you are, you should get rid of your little one or get rid of the ego or, is not. Uh, what, I, what I see as being the case. I, I see where my ego is. My face is in, the, in that little box in the screen and in the mirror. And in some, you know, in some way it's happening between you and me. But here is this openness. And so this, the journey of life is an extraordinary journey because when you see who you are, you see you're the one and self-evidently you realize you've always been the one and therefore Throughout this whole journey, you were the one. So you were the one, kind of forgetting you were the one and reawakening to being the one. And reawakening, as we are enjoying it now, is so different from the first stage. Because, because I've got a deep sense of being Richard and manifesting as Richard as the one. Now when I'm with Rick, I have a profound sense of you being a separate person and of being the one. So, uh, whereas when I was a baby, I had no developed sense of you being a separate person, you see. Mm. So, so, growing up is a deepening uh, sense of self and other, and awakening to who you are, uh, celebrates the two of us in the one now. So, uh, yeah, a wonderful journey that uh, celebrates our individual selves, it doesn't deny it. You're probably aware of that T.S. Eliot poem of coming back to the place from which we started and discovering it for the first time. Yes. That poem. Yes. And that once you see who you are, you you see people are talking about it all over the place. Mm. Yeah. Now, of course, sometimes people, you know, you hear in certain spiritual circles, people blaming society or something for causing babies to lose their innocence and become adults, as if it's some kind of conspiracy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it was you I was listening to, I listened to something, no, maybe it was Peter Russell, but he was talking about how it's, it's a natural process and, and, you know, God plays this hide-and-seek game uh, with himself, and if you didn't hide, then you wouldn't be able to, to seek, it wouldn't be a fun game. So, so you kind of get lost in the, in, the, in the parts, and then from there you, and only from there can you seek to rediscover the whole, but I think as you're just saying, you know, having come full circle, you have something that was more, that's more than what you started with. You know? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I, I have this uh, feeling that the, the one by itself, which is, uh, as it were, the baby stage, you know, in the beginning was the one, it is, uh, as a kind of creation story, is a wonderful place. I mean, you're, you're there as the one, and you're aware that you are. That is the most fundamental and beautiful miracle I am. I can't explain myself, you mm -hmm. see. But the second thing that, that comes for me after that joyful, ongoing appreciation of being, impossible being, is, gosh, you know, I'd like to share this with someone. <laughs> but there's you know, no one I, else I, here. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm the only one. You know, is it, that, who can I? Well, I've already achieved the, the impossible, which is being, uh, let me achieve another impossible, which is to create others mm. who are really other, who have achieved being, and yet are myself. Mm. I mean, that is so, is so beautiful and deep and clever, and uh, uh, so it's why we're talking today, isn't it? It's the one talking with itself. Yeah. And it's an interesting process to consider because, it, you know, it, I mean, if the one had any sense of time, you'd have to credit it with having tremendous patience because it takes billions of years to create stars which, which live out their life cycles and then explode and create heavy elements which, you know, move around and eventually, you know, end up as planets and, and you know, microbes and, and, you know, which eventually evolve into human beings who can have a conversation like this. That took billions of years. But, of course, 
you know, I mean, in, in, in eternity there's no time, so I guess we can't really credit the one with having a lot of patience. It's just... <laughs> I, w I would say I would go for both. I'd yeah, say. maybe so. Yeah, so I think, <laughs> well done. And there's a, a rather nice phrase by the philosopher Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. Life is lived forwards and understood backwards. Mm. And I think that applies to the one. You know, Oh my God, look what I've done. Mm. How did I do that? I haven't a clue. You know, did I know where I was going? Uh, no, but I'm kind of working it out now. You know, putting the dots together, as they say. How amazing. Mm. I mean, extraordinary, clever. In, in some cosmologies, it's, it's said that, you know, consciousness, because it's consciousness, it becomes conscious of itself, and then in become, becoming conscious of itself, uh, a duality is, or a threefold nature is set up of, you know, observer, observed, and process of observation, and then that sort of bifurcates and, and expands and becomes more greater and greater complexity. So it's by virtue of the fact that consciousness is conscious and is, is self-referral that the whole universe emerges. Yes, I know. Well, I think I can see that, we can see that in our own lives as the one. You, as a baby, you're the one without any developed sense of others. Mm -hmm. And growing up is learning empathy, is learning to place yourself in someone else's shoes and feel for them. And realize that when you do this, you feel something, and then when they do it, you can't feel it, but you grant that they are feeling something. Mm. And as a baby, you haven't got that. And so growing up is learning, in a way, the one to go out of itself and place it in itself in others, place yourself in others, and kind of be there, which includes looking back and seeing yourself. Yeah. And uh, uh, so it's a kind of, I think those cosmologies have got a very good point. Yeah, and actually you described something in your book that illustrates the point. Um, you know, the point being that um, consciousness being self-referral is the font of, of creativity and, and creation. You, you, you spoke about how you were creating this online course and you'd kind of run out of ideas and you were working and it was late and you had to create a new lesson for the next day. So you just got in the bathtub and kind of relaxed into the oneness and into being. And then by taking recourse to that, a whole new uh, surge of, of yes. creativity emerged from that. Yes, I think that uh, it's the awakening and the mindfulness thing, perhaps, that we were talking about earlier. Awakening is seeing this, mindfulness is going on seeing it, living from it. Mm. And as you live from it, you start to know the ropes. Uh, one of the ropes is, one of the things that happens is that things come and go, and they grow and they diminish. And of course, when we have something growing, a creative experience or anything, joy, well, we want it to keep on growing, uh, but it doesn't. And when it starts to go away, uh, it's tempting to think either you're doing something wrong or everything's gone wrong. Or... But as you uh, stay with this nothingness that's always full of something, after a, a while you, you begin to realize things come and go. And when they're going, be patient because something else will come. Mm. Uh, and it'll be more surprising and better than you could ever plan or know. Uh, I mean, this very interview is, is, in my experience, pouring out of or into the great void now. My voice is coming out of nothing, your voice is in the nothing, two voices, you know, the screen, the sensations that kind of clothe the scene, the thoughts that are in the scene, that there's no mind here to mind. Well, th this is all emerging now. What a clever nothingness. Mm. And so I, I think uh, after awakening, mindfulness you know uh, after enlightenment the laundry or something well yeah. after awakening mindfulness and uh, the the kind of astonishment in the long run of what it comes up with it is uh, we think it's run out of ideas and it hasn't begun yet you know mm -hmm. incredible i think uh, i do uh, uh, a lot of kind of creative work uh, I'm writing a comic book with a, a friend who's the illustrator. I'm, I'm illustrating, I do a lot of video editing, I love it. Mm. And uh, I've been, in the, so earlier in May, I gave a talk at our annual gathering in Salisbury on the hierarchy. And uh, it was an hour long talk. And I know the hierarchy well, I've been studying it a lot because we're doing this book. 
And uh, when you do a comic book, you've got to put things very simply that, be, uh, that communicate something real and valuable, of course. So I'd been really simplifying things. So I, I wasn't, you know, I knew what I was going to say more or less, but I didn't write it down. I just got the images together, the PowerPoint. And uh, at the last moment, Amaranato, the monk we mentioned, said uh, just before the talk, look, I've got my iPhone, I'll put it on the desk, I'll record it. Oh, okay. So then I had the recording, and then afterwards I thought, well, I've got, I had a few pictures, you know, on my computer that I showed everyone, but I could illustrate that. Well, I've been working on it for three weeks. I mean, to illustrate an hour-long talk, no visual of me, but my God, it's a, a process of, uh, it feels as though the images come out of the great void. Mm. But you've got to be patient, and they, they're not always finished when they come out, you know, anything like this. And in the end, you stand back in awe at the creativity of the one. Yeah, uh, and it's not just when you're doing something like that. It's it's now. It's when you're having lunch. It's uh, you know everything is pouring from here. <laughs> there was a story in the Vedas where Brahma, the creator, was supposed to create creation, and he couldn't do it. It was like nothing was happening. And so some, right. some voice came to him, which basically said, "Do tapas," which means you know go within, t take a hundred and eighty degree turn, come back to the oneness. And right. then he, he went and did that for eons or something. And then having done that, he was able to just bring forth the whole creation. Yes, <laughs> I know. We, we tend to go in the wrong direction. Yeah. We, we go for the thing. Well, rest in the nothing and the thing will come. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, pull the arrow back on the bow and then it will fly forward. Very good. <clears throat> yes. Um, you were mentioning the four stages, baby, adolescent, adult. And then I don't know if we spent enough time talking about the final stage, which is the, the, no. the, the sage or the, the seer. Well, let me run up to that just a, a bit more. J just uh, very briefly review one idea. Uh, the infectiousness of anyone's state of mind in a basic sense. So the baby says to everyone, broadcast openness, and everyone is given permission to be open. The child broadcasts, I'm a bit in the box, but I'm mainly out, you know, come and play with me, all right. The adult who has, is now suppressing his or her true nature is broadcasting, I'm a thing, you're a thing. And this is mainly nonverbal. You only have to be looked at by someone and you feel looked at. And they are nonverbally telling you, you've got a head, you're a thing, you're a person, and so am I. And uh, when you then go through to the fourth stage, which is the ongoing mindfulness of who you are, this is highly infectious too, because you can't see who you are separately. <laughs> you know, it's seeing that everyone is within you. But there's a double thing going on here, because, uh, say, between us now, I am still broadcasting to you that you're Rick and I'm Richard, and you're broadcasting to me this, the same uh, in that sense. But now we also have this awareness of the space or the silence in which it's all going on. And this is highly infectious. This is, I think, satsang. This is uh, the many being together in awareness of the one. And this is a whole new way of living. And, you know, I think as a species, we haven't been here before. Hmm. I think we're, we're, it's a very exciting time. And... Uh, I, that's what I love hanging out with friends and uh, sharing our experience of this openness. You know, it, it's what the one, in my view, wants to do and uh, loves doing. And this is living uh, uh, and being each other. And, uh, you know, it's not always a high, uh, it, uh, of course, it's a neutral thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's ongoing attention to the obvious. Uh, mm. I remember one time about, I don't know, five years ago, I was sitting in a place which is sometimes used as a ballet studio, so they have all these mirrors on the walls, you know, and um, I was sitting there talking to a friend, and, and I happened to glance over and, and saw the two, of, looked in the mirror and saw the two of us sitting there talking, and I was kind of startled because I thought, I mean, I'm used to sort of just regarding myself as this sort of vast presence, and, and then all of a sudden I realized, wow, that's how people see me you know this, yes. this little guy that that's you know who's kind of getting bald and you know, <laughs> has a I beard know. <laughs> what a contrast <laughs> yeah. 
But then you, it, I think you can have compassion for that one for yourself. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it, you embrace him. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I know. Uh, it's it's deep. It's uh, highly amusing. It's it's very practical. It it is poetry in motion. It, it's uh, yes, yeah. fantastic. And yet we zoom in and out. I mean, don't we? There's a sort of a a flexibility or, or, or uh, it's like as if uh, there's a spectrum between you know pure oneness and pinpoint individuality and we kind of swing back and forth on that spectrum according to the needs of the situation yes, I, I mean, well, if well. you're driving in heavy traffic and you you know it's really kind of a uh, you know you have to be very careful and attentive and all you know you, you don't want to just be wallowing in the oneness nor nor do you want your uh, you know your commercial airline pilot or your brain surgeon to be doing that uh, you want but at the, but you know I think you, maybe you will say here it would be nice if your airline pilot or your brain surgeon could have that sort of broad uh, settled awareness while f focusing sharply that it doesn't have to be an, an ideally should not be an either or situation oh well put yes mm -hmm. you see it, it is basically a neutral experience. Mm -hmm. So if you associate this experience with a, a, a trance-like uh, oceanic feeling of oneness... Which it well, can it, be, I mean, in a meditative state, you know, withdrawn from the world, it can be like that. Yes, and that's very healthy in its own time and place. But it, it's not uh, dependent on that. It's, uh, right. And so you, do, you can uh, do your job in this neutral, from this neutral nothingness and not uh, you know, be uh, uh, thinking that you've lost who you are. Right. <clears throat> Which I think, for the most part, people tend to do. You know, they get kind of zeroed in on the, the point value, uh, you know, the, the focusing of attention to the exclusion of who they are, uh, to the exclusion of the oneness. The, you know, the, the famous movie screen analogy where the movie is playing on the screen and it overshadows the screen, you forget all about the screen because you're so caught up in the movie. Yes, oh yes, yes. I, I'm thinking that perhaps I, c I could take uh, us and the viewer through uh, uh, one of the experiments at this point. Yeah, what let's do, do. absolutely. Okay. All right, so uh, this uh, one is a little bit of a guided meditation and uh, so uh, I will guide you through, it'll take just a three or four minutes, is that all right? Sure, whatever, any amount of oh. time. All right, so uh, the viewer can just start by doing this with their hands and noticing their hands disappear and then reappear. Mm -hmm. And this is a nonverbal experience, but I'm going to call it putting my hands in nothing and bringing them out. All right, so uh, you can choose what words you like. And it is neutral, it, it's not uh, necessarily feeling good, it's just observation. So we also call this nothingness or this emptiness a single eye. And in order to bring your attention to this, uh, make your hands like this, uh, like glasses, put your fingers together. You see two holes with an image in each hole. Now slowly put them on and notice what happens to the dividing line while well, it disappears. Mm -hmm. So, the two become one. So this is noticing that, uh, of course, in the photograph or the mirror, I can see two eyes there, that's my appearance, but here I've got what I call one eye, it's not even an eye. All right, and I can put my hands into it all the way around so the viewer can try this. So I'd like you to notice a few, uh, what I find fascinating aspects to this. So if you are, you're looking, at, this is this pointing uh, gesture, which is quite useful because it's two-way. And uh, this is into the nothing and out to the something. But there's no dividing line between the two. So I'm going to use that idea of two-way, that's what I mean. It's a provisional thing. So I'm looking from the nothingness and I'm looking out. There's always something, whether it's visual or sound or something. And I'm looking out now, and if you look at any object in front of you, you'll uh, notice that you can compare it for size to another thing. So it's either bigger, smaller, or roughly the same size. So my hand is bigger than the glass, uh, or smaller than the glass, or something like that. So size is relative, it's comparable. Bigger, smaller, or roughly the same. 
Now look at the whole view and ask yourself, how big is this view? How big is this whole eye, the, the field? Well, you see, I don't find a second one on the right to compare it with, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't say that mine is bigger than yours because I only experience mine. And this uh, is very, uh, this is what I would say some traditions call the incomparable, incomparable one because it's, there's nothing to compare it with. So we've, we've done that for uh, size. I can't say how big I am or how big the view is because there's nothing to compare it with. People, so, people do things to change the size of their own view. They go to the Grand Canyon or they go up to the top of the Empire State Building and, and so on because they get a thrill out of a bigger view, right? Oh, yeah, it's all very close, yes. But that's all the changing view within the whole field. Mm -hmm. And the, the, whether you're looking at the Grand Canyon or an ant, the field doesn't get bigger or smaller. Because mm -hmm. it's got nothing. Well, the other thing to notice is uh, as you look at any object, you can see things all the way around. I'm looking at the computer screen now, and there's a, it's got an edge, and there's something all the way around it. My hand has got an edge, and then there's a background. Mm -hmm. Anything that you look at is inside a bigger environment. Now you look at the whole field. Is it inside anything? Well, I don't see anything around it. It's not, not contained. And if you look, for example, you just pick an object, that object you're looking at is right in the middle of your field of view and most in focus. And then there, as you keep looking at an object, but just notice towards the periphery, it gets vaguer and vaguer. Now you look at another object, and now that is in the middle. And as you look towards the edge, you, there's a point where you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So now I can imagine the ceiling above and the floor below and the wall, you know, some. My direct experience is the scene now, the visual scene is kind of hanging in nothingness. Okay, so uh, now I'm going just to move a little bit forward into, into uh, eyes closed for a moment, if that's okay, mm -hmm. and just looking at thoughts and feelings and things like that. Sure. Yep. Okay, so the viewer can try this with us. So now close your eyes. On present evidence, Rick has disappeared and been replaced by a darkness. <laughs> now open your eyes and the scene reappears. In my own experience, the world is kind of disappearing, the room anyway, and reappearing in the nothingness. And I take this seriously. It's, a, it's a, uh, one of the powers of the first person is to make things disappear and reappear. Anyway. Uh, keep your eyes closed and the room has been replaced by a darkness in my experience and there are flecks of light in it so I can distinguish between things within the field of darkness but how big is the whole field of darkness? well I don't find a second one to compare it with do you? no, so it doesn't have a size no and I don't find it inside anything. It's uncontained. Mm -hmm. All right, so open your eyes again. See? So whether you've got your eyes open or closed, the, the field, the, your field of experience, uh, you can't say how big it is. I can't. Uh, it's not inside anything. So now we close our eyes again and be aware of sound. And uh, you can hear my voice, and if you say something, Rick, you can hear your voice. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, here's my and voice. There it is. <laughs> so you can distinguish between different things within, uh, within the field of sound. But as you listen, uh, you probably maybe hear a distant traffic, or some sounds are loud, and some are soft, and some are you like, and some you don't, perhaps. But then there's a point where you can't hear anything else. So, on present evidence, in your own experience, how big is this field of sound? Well, uh, I don't, go ahead. Well, I don't find a second one to compare it with. No. I can't say. <laughs> your voice is in it, my voice is in it, and there's a point where I can't hear anything else, and I. In words, I say, okay, so the sound is arising in this silence. 
So now if you open your eyes again, now we've got the visual field, you see, which has uh, no clear boundary, and uh, I can't say how big it is. And at the same time, the sounds are in this field as well. And all the sounds are within this awareness. Because I don't find the colors of the things I'm looking at and the sounds happening in a different space. So, here we go. Close your eyes again and be aware of body sensations. And you can, uh, some you like and some you don't, I suppose. Some are strong and some are weak. And some are to the left and some to the right, perhaps. And uh, so different sensations going on and changing within the field. But how big is the whole field of sensation? Well, again, I don't find a second one to compare it with. I can't say. And uh, there's a point where I can't sense or feel anything. So positively, I say, all the sensation is arising in the great world. Now, I identify very easily with my body sensations. So if I say, I can't say how big the field of sensation is, and I don't find it inside anything, I could just as easily say, I don't know, I can't say how big I am. I'm not contained. I'm free. So now if you open your eyes, you've still got your body sensations. Uh, but they're not happening, in my experience, in a different space or awareness from what I'm seeing and hearing. And uh, so I have this very physical, it's not just visual, visual you see, very physical sense of being uh, uncontained, uh, at large. Uh, it's as if my body sensations blend with the walls. Uh, uh, so, uh, just uh, a couple of other things. If you go back into closing your eyes again. You're going to make me sleepy with all this eye closing. I uh, know. Well, <laughs> it's worth doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh, yes. people often ask about thoughts and feelings, which we'll do now. So you're aware of thoughts and feelings. So um, what you're thinking about, uh, if you want to create thoughts, you can count to five slowly and you know, just be aware of those thoughts. Or imagine a blue circle. We call these mental objects. Or remember the face of a friend and the, f the affection you feel to the friend. And so uh, what we call mind, all the, the thoughts and feelings and reactions and images and so on, all going on and changing. Now the same question, how big is this field of mind? Well again, I don't find a second one to compare it with. And I don't find it happening inside any container or happening in a separate space of awareness from the sounds and the darkness and sensations. So now if you open your eyes again, my experience is my thoughts are at large in the room from my point of view and my sensations are at large and uh, there's only one field, only one. Uh, and uh, so this, it's just a little indication that this headless way isn't just visual, it embraces all the senses. And uh, so that's what, that's um, guiding our attention uh, back to the one. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think I read an interview uh, that you did with the blind person. Um, you know, so for him, all the pointing and all that is not quite so meaningful but the, the this can be done even if you can't see yes yes uh, in that article that was by alan it's on the website mm -hmm. uh, he had seen uh, when he was young and lost his sight so when he did the workshop with douglas and it came to the pointing he could imagine pointing i see yeah and then he asked himself, well, how would I show this to someone who's never seen, who can't imagine? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, for a blind person, still has a sense of direction. Yeah. So the sound is there. And then what you normally do is you think that you're something hearing the sound. So the experiment is to turn the arrow of attention around 
and listen to what is here. Of course, you don't hear anything here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a good article that. And uh, I, I was I gave a workshop in the Boston area a few weeks ago, and there's a blind person there, blind man, and just marvelous uh, mm. sharing. Marvelous. Yes. So when you put us through those exercises just now, um, I'm a little. I'm a little unclear as to what what the significance in each case of the question how big, you know how 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 big is your visual scene how big is you know, um, yeah what what are you trying to get at exactly by by that particular description? Well, because we normally uh, well we grow up mm -hmm. to think that we're small. A baby has no sense of how big it is. Right. Uh, by the time you're an adult, you have a very clear sense of being small and separate. And you, you, what you've learned to do is uh, think of your sensations as in as localized, mm -hmm. and uh, think of your mind as localized. This is a, a, a well understood. It's called theory of mind that when you're very young, you don't have a sense of that your mind is private. Uh, uh, so, in other words, uh, there's a test they do for this, where you have a, a young child, an uh, infant or a child, and you put, you, you show them a box, and you open the box, and you put some pencils in the box, and you close the box, and then someone comes in the room, and you ask the child, does that person know what is in the box? And the child will say, of course, mm. everyone knows what's in the box, right? Huh. No? Because it has not got a sense of it having a separate mind yet. Mm. And uh, this is why, you know, a, a very young child won't keep secrets and a clue what a secret is. Now, you do the same test uh, with the same child, uh, six months later, see, and show them what's in the box and then close it and the adult comes in and, this, and does the adult, does that person know what's in the box? No. Now that shows that it has realized that what it thinks and sees and feels is private mm. and that someone else has a different experience. That's a learned thing. We learn it so well we don't realize it. But in that process, in a sense, I, you see, I never experience anyone's thoughts but my own. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I, uh, but what I learn to do is to think that these thoughts are in this separate box here, literally, two or three feet separate from the screen, and that you've got thoughts over there in your head, which I can't see, inside your head, you see. And so my mind is small, and yours is small. Okay? All right, that's a really valuable thing. You can see how valuable that is, a sense of self and others. So we've got that going. But then when you take a fresh look, you see, uh, I see, that my mind is not in a box. It's at large. It has no boundary. It's, it's not contained. It's coming out of nothing. My body sensations are not a, a private thing. And you've got yours over there. They're the only ones in town. And they're at large. So now I have the direct experience that I have no boundary, that I feel big. It's, it's not just a visual thing. I, my body, my sensations are as big as the world. My mind is as big as the world. Uh, this is just simply true, but I now am different from the infant because I understand for you, I'm not everywhere. And so I have this dual awareness that for others I'm just Richard, but for me I'm the one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a very physical, this is very therapeutic because the, the deep conviction that your mind is a tiny local small thing in this tiny box potentially drives everyone mad. <laughs> I mean, it's like trying to fit a thousand bees in a tiny box, you know, buzzing away. Now, when you see there's no box, the bees fly out into the world. That is one of the most therapeutic, I'm sure, therapeutic things you can do, is seeing your mind is at large. It doesn't mean you don't then attend to things, of course you do. But seeing that you are living from no mind, this basic freedom, it is very healthy, it's normal, it's natural. Uh, it's the other that is kind of arrested development when you haven't uh, kind of moved on to see that you're at large really. Mm. And this, this sense of being big and at large is so healthy, physically healthy, mentally healthy, 
spiritually healthy, of course. Remember Marshi Mahesh Yogi giving a talk about Maya one time, and he was, he was talking about how the whole ocean gets squeezed into a drop. And he said, you know, imagine the strength, the strength of grip that could squeeze an ocean into a drop. You know, you are that ocean, and yet you, you, you think of yourself as a drop. <laughs> you know? Yes, uh, I know. And then uh, imagine the power and energy that comes from the expansion. Mm, mm. I'll bet there's also some significance to your whole thing with, uh, you know, the way babies love to play peekaboo and they think that, you know, the, yeah. some, they disappear or, or the person disappears when they go like that, you know, and then they reappear. Yeah. Is, yes. Is... yes, there is. I think, you see, this is such a, a familiar thing. I mean, it's the most familiar. Who, who you really are is the most familiar thing or no thing. It's what you've always been. It's, it's what you always will be. It, it's basic reality. Yes. But this... Uh, you see, this dual awareness, uh, awareness of yourself as a thing and of, as no thing containing things, uh, to, to, to only be what you look like is to be scared. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, but to awaken to your central nothingness is to sort of be invisible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, now, you're, gosh, you're free to express. Yeah. You're freer, at least, to express mm. and to be yourself. Yeah, I think so, it's the uh, Manduka Upanishad, it says, certainly all fear is born of duality. Yes. Yeah. I'm reminded, Douglas wrote a book in the 60s called Religions of the World, mm -hmm. and he uh, attempted to show there how each religion uh, expresses this non-verbal truth in a different way. And, and so he went beneath the differences of style to to essential to the essential, and uh, uh, you you're being quoting uh, uh, various scriptures there, and uh, I I think that indicates that this basic experience uh, has been appreciated in all different cultures mm -hmm. and expressed in different ways, and you know I had this I was talking with uh, a friend a couple of days ago that the idea that you've got the only way. <laughs> I mean, uh, and the guy next door is saying, well, we've got the only way. I mean, it is, you know, you only have to think about it, and at least one of you is wrong, if not both, you know. And uh, the discovery of who you really are is going beneath the, the differing expressions sure. and uh, traditions to the central core, from which you can appreciate every way. And, uh, gosh, doesn't the world need this? Uh, you know, now as much, if not more than ever. Yeah. Well, I think these days NASA is saying that there may well be a hundred million inhabitable planets in our galaxy alone. And of course, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So if Jesus is the only way, is he on tour? And, and if so, like, if, does he spend 33 years on each planet? And if so, how could the world only be 6,000 years old? I mean, it definitely brings up some problems if you think you've got the only way. <laughs> yes, and I think, you see, Jesus uh, was one of those uh, beautiful, uh, extraordinary people who woke up to who he was and spoke and stood up for it and died for it. Yeah. Uh, he had a, a clear, I would say, uh, he, he awoke and he that was then mindful and he told people about it. Of course, if you then hear someone speaking about it, if you don't get it yourself, then you project on them either the best or the worst. Mm. And uh, this is again the difference between the inside and the outside. That Jesus was not the one. Uh, Jesus was an appearance of the one. Yeah. Well, that brings up an interesting point, which is, I mean, and you've said, you know, a number of times that you know, there's no hierarchy in this. No one's got a, got it better than anybody else. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you talked about mindfulness, and and we've talked, we've alluded to, you know, the degree to which this is sustained. We might also allude to the. We might also discuss the degree to which this is manifested or expressed. I mean, some people seem to radiate like, you know, lighthouses, like blast furnaces, and and others are more of a dim light. So even though it's the same essence, it seems like there's a wide uh, range of possibilities in terms of how fully this essence can be expressed or reflected in various reflectors, don't you think? 
Yes, uh, I would uh, distinguish between the experience and the meaning or the experience and the expression. Mm -hmm. And uh, the experience is the same for everyone. Yeah. And the expression is different for everyone. And of course, some people radiate, you know, and, and some people don't. But it, it's a, a very superficial thing to me, in a way. You know, it, it, the essence is the thing. And uh, uh, so, yes, I mean, beautiful beings. But I think when you see this, you see that everyone is the one, and everyone is beautiful in their own way. And I, I don't uh, kind of, you know, I'm, uh, Radiation, uh, someone's radiating, it doesn't really impress me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I I'll mean, tell you, I mean, the very funny thing is that uh, Sam, who does the website, I've known him about eight or nine years, I, I went and did a workshop in Western Australia, uh, you know, eight, nine years ago, whatever it was. In fact, for Pete and Pearl, who were practically blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, uh, Pete had got in touch with me, email and read my book and I was, I looked him up and he was, you know, I was trying to work out whether he'd really got it. Uh, and he, 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 sight varies, Pearl's sight it was even worse, but uh, he could see a bit. And he, he said that he was walking along the beach with their dog, you know, and uh, the light comes across the water from the sun just to him, you see. So that's one of the indicators you're the one. And it was very funny <laughs> because, Pearl, his wife, then says, no, it doesn't, uh, Pete, it comes to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, they invited me, and uh, their good friend was Sam. And Sam uh, came to the workshop and got the point. He'd been a Sanyazin, you know, Osho person, who mm -hmm. left in the end. And he was blown away by this. But anyway, uh, the radiation thing, he said, uh, he said, well, one of the things that impressed me when I walked in the room, Richard, was I saw this guy sitting on the chair and I thought, who's sitting in the teacher's chair then? You know, someone's gone and sat, you know. In other words, uh, he was impressed by, by my unimpressiveness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think sometimes radiation can be a matter of projection on the part of those who are perceiving, you know. It's like, you know, when Mick Jagger gets up in front of 100,000 people, he seems to radiate a lot. But it's really just, you know, he's just kind of reflecting the enthusiasm of the crowd. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we were talking earlier about uh, continue, this is a lifetime thing, you know, continued growth, continued unfoldment in some sense. And so, um, I mean, taking the electrical field as an example, we have the same electrical field for all light bulbs, and but some light bulbs are not so bright, some are more bright, and maybe you know, maybe we're wired to just be a certain wattage of light bulb f for yeah, our, our whole life. But maybe maybe the metaphor falls short there, and we're actually able to up our wattage as we go through in terms of expressing that field more radiantly. Oh yes, well I think it was D. T. Suzuki who said, uh, you know, penetrate to the center, uh, and it turns the kind of the frightened little dog into the lion. Mm. Uh, it's a profoundly transformative process, but you can't really second guess how it's going to transform you, I don't think. No. And also, uh, I think that I certainly find, and, and many, many friends of mine find, that after a wh while, you, you, you don't bother really so much about how much you're doing it. I mean, you, it's always there. It's always on tap whenever you want it. It comes through when you're least expecting it as well. You can access it at will. You're kind of taking your temperature spiritually, kind of becomes, you know, not interesting and you get on with living it. Sure. Yes. There's even a bit in your book where you, you or Douglas quote um, Ramana Maharshi is saying pretty much the same thing, that you just you know, it's not something that you're like dwelling on all the time, and most of the time you may even forget it. But if you want to check, there it is. Yes, and that's why I think uh, it, it's so delightful to hang out with friends like you today, mm -hmm. uh, because you're sort of consciously bringing it onto the front burner without any particular effort, and you're kind of infecting each other with it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A um, couple of bits in your book that I wrote down because I thought they'd be interesting um, springboards for discussion. Uh, there was one section where, again, I don't remember, you kind of uh, put a lot of Douglas into your book, so I'm not sure which of you came up with this, but you were talking about individual results. And uh, there's a list of about six or seven of them here. Um, maybe we could just g g go through them. Uh, one is, one senses awaken. Yes. 
uh, well, I think it is as if a veil is drawn aside. When you see your, this clear, clear openness, it's a common experience for people to experience the world more vividly, uh, clearly. Uh, that's for testing, you know. Uh, test it and see if it's true, but certainly it, it's as if uh, the fog of your face disappears and there's the world right here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The next one was, one's heart goes out to the world. Yes, I think you lose your head and find your heart. Mm. Uh, and uh, you, you are, um, you know, there's, uh, there's no separation between you and others. And uh, you feel more deeply, uh, uh, as well as being completely free and detached, you're completely involved. Yes. Mm. Another, oh. next one is, one's mind awakens. Yes. Well, I, I think that when you uh, think of your mind as this small, limited thing, uh, really, there's nothing new under the sun in it, and you then awaken to being the no-mind from which mind, which is the whole universe, is pouring. Uh, you, you're, you've opened Aladdin's cave, and uh, things are pouring out, and you, I think, with experience, uh, gain more confidence that it is infinitely creative. Mm. It's nothing to do with you personally. You've got to put your bit in. Uh, and the other thing is that this uh, awakening to who you are, uh, when I first read On Having No Head, or when I read it you know, years and years ago, uh, Douglas first talks, well, there's two things here. It talks about the experience and then he has two uh, initial reflections, which I'll briefly say, which is, first of all, because I'm face to no face with others, confrontation was a lie. It's the end of confrontation. And the second thing is, now that I see that all the world is in me, I must grant the same condition to you. And this is a beautiful pun. And therefore, I think the world of you. Mm. Now, the, the, there was a, a sentence a bit later, where he, he said, and this um, it profoundly affects your way of thinking. And I thought, I didn't really understand at the time. Well, read the hierarchy. This opens up a profoundly new way of thinking of the world that flows really on the back of relativity and, and lots of other things. Uh, so that, you know, I'm in you, you're in me. Uh, I see you here, but I project you back there. Uh, all these very deep ideas. Um, it's a, a one mind is refreshed and opened and given a, a new lease. It's uh, yes, for sure. Hmm. It seems that what you just said would be there. There's so many horrors in our world. You know, things that people do to each other, which would not really be possible if one had the perspective that you just described. You know, I mean, you you wouldn't sort of. Cut, I mean, some people who are really deranged do this kind of thing. They cut themselves in order to feel alive. But generally, if you're psychologically healthy and, you know, if your finger got into the ink or something, you wouldn't punish it by cutting it, you know, it's a bad finger, because it's part of you. <laughs> and yeah. uh, if, uh, you know, if one perceived the world that way, imagine how we would treat each other. I know. This is the work we're involved with, is sharing this as widely and uh, as freely as possible. Mm -hmm. The world needs it. But it's namaste, isn't it? I, uh, I have now discovered that Richard, at the center of Richard is God, the yeah. One. And therefore now when I meet you, I, I know that you are the One too. Mm -hmm. And so I honor the, the One in you. It's the same One in me. So yes, that leads to love, doesn't it? Mm. Yes. Here's the next point on that list. Um, one's day-to-day -day problems are sorted out and one's unconscious is taken care of. And I was sort of reminded of the idea of a cosmic computer that is kind of working everything out and, uh, you know, with far greater perfection and intelligence than we're able to muster individually. It, it sort of helps work things out for us, often in surprising ways. Oh, every day, little things. <laughs> And big things. Uh, I mean, it, it's just an ongoing education. Uh, I mean, I don't think it knows how it does it, you know. Uh, it's just uh, incredible. Uh, uh, I think the moment you run out of ideas is the moment God, you know, God takes over and says, all right, well, okay, 
you know, let me have a go now. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, that's again for testing. All of this is for testing, yes. Mm. Here's the next point. One ceases playing games. Yes. Uh, uh, Douglas wrote a paper for Eric Byrne, the psychoanalyst, uh, back in the 60s called The Face Game. Mm -hmm. And he had read Burns's book, The Games People Play. And he uh, had the idea that all the different games are based on one master game, the game I have a face here. You see it here, but I don't. But now I play the game that I've got one, therefore I'm separate. And therefore all the other games come from this, you see. I, what kind of person I am in relationship to you. I must be a thing in order to play that game. But when you see there's no face, you see through this basic game. And so essentially you stop playing games. Now we're complicated characters, you know, so I certainly wouldn't claim not to play games, you know. But you, you're in the moment of seeing, you're not playing the basic game. And you can say that with confidence. You're, you're, you're seeing, you're free of that game. And so that will uh, affect how you are in the world, it must do. Mm. Nice. And here's the final one in that list, one finds peace of mind. Yes. I remember asking Douglas once, uh, does this give you peace of mind? And he said, no. And he paused, you know, a dramatic pause, and then he said, it shows you that you are peace. Mm. It doesn't give you it. And this is, it's like your movement thing. All the movement is there. There's no rest there. The stillness is here. Mm. Here is that you could call that peace. And so peace is with, it, with you, even in the most tumultuous situations. Nice. And what a resource to be aware of that uh, inner peace, if you like. Yeah, I think the first or second verse in the Yoga Sutras is, uh, yoga is the sensation of the fluctuations of the mind which obviously would lead to peace. And, uh, but that's not to say that you won't have a mind afterwards that can think and do and so on, but it, you know, if, if it's grounded in peace, then, and that peace patheth, under, patheth understanding, as the Bible says, then it can really be quite um, rock-like. In fact, there's a word for that too. It's a, the, the intellect is anchored to the rock-like. Yes, I, I think that's just the way it is. And this gesture, two-way pointing, comes into play, mm -hmm. I think. Excuse me. Just as it's face there to no face here, mm -hmm. so it is thoughts and feelings and mind and stress to no thoughts and feelings and mind here, no stress here. And so I'm not getting rid of my thoughts and, and thinking and feeling and stress and so on. I'm placing it. And here is, there's the zone out there where all that goes on, and here's the zone where it doesn't. Mm. And I, I enjoy both, you see. That's tricky, though. I mean, there's a lot of very high-stress professions these days. They talk about teacher burnout, and policemen have a lot of difficulties with stress and often react by becoming, you know, abusive or violent. And then, of course, you have the situation in Iraq and Afghanistan with you know, tens of thousands of soldiers coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, uh, I mean, uh, if you were, like, if, you know, if the Army hired Richard Lang to prepare these guys to go over there, do you, do you feel like that seeing would be an effective antidote uh, or inoculation against the, the stress of war? Or do you feel like they'd lose interest in going and <laughs> all go AWOL or, or what? Um, well, I, 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 seeing isn't a technique, you see. It's not something to kind of slot in with the other techniques. It's well, but you have all these exercises to facilitate it. Yes, yes. Well, I, I have given up trying to give workshops to, you know, say, reduce stress or whatever it is. Uh, but I think the thing is, um, go for the center and see what happens. Mm. And... Uh, if someone, if a soldier was interested in this, I'd share it, but I wouldn't uh, introduce it as part of a course for the soldiers. You know, it, 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 uh, it's not that kind of thing. Really. So you actually did give workshops to reduce stress, but then you gave up on it because it didn't work out. Uh, well, I think that I have tried my hand at various times. That uh, you know, the whole thing of therapy. I, I practice as a therapist. 
mm-hmm. of uh, I'm profoundly aware of the therapeutic value of this. You yeah. see. But if people come to you because their mother-in-law is uh, get, getting on their you know mind, or they've got the boss is being difficult, mm-hmm. if you try and slip in headlessness. It's like slipping in anything else. It's not what they came for, and it's somewhat presumptuous. Huh. Uh, so I wouldn't do it now at all. I be it. That's the most powerful thing. You see, even now the words now between us are in a way superficial. The thing is being it non-verbally. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so my policy: if someone invites me to do a workshop, I'm hundred percent sharing, seeing. But if someone's come for uh, therapy or tai chi or dance, the various things I do, I don't, I've learned, I've just, you know, taken the route not to uh, talk about this, you know. Mm. I don't suppress it, but they haven't come for that, so respect what they've come for. So do you yourself feel stressed out sometimes? Yes. Like, you know, when you're <laughs> under a lot of pressure or whatever, yeah. you know, traveling yeah. or something. And, yeah. uh, and so when you're feeling stressed out, um, is it just a matter of getting some relief by recognizing, you know, your your inner your inner nature, which is non-stress, and, and taking refuge in that, or do you, does that actually serve as a, a solvent to the stress, where you can kind of feel less stressed by taking re- recourse to it, and hopefully even f- get totally refreshed? All of that. All of yes, that. All, okay. all of that. Um... Yes, I, I, I think that uh, I, there's a, probably a, a point, you know, if I've got a bad headache mm-hmm. where, you know, I, I'm not really, for a while, not very aware of who I am, you know, and then I, you know, try and do that. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't take aspirin or something, you know, but I think that uh, uh, my policy is to bring my attention back here. I know it is. Mm. Uh, and... The thing is, it doesn't get rid of the headache straight away, necessarily, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but... If it takes uh, the edge off it. It does something, and then... Uh, uh, I have a friend who's in, in hospital at the moment, in great pain, and she uh, and she's applying this, you know, and it's a kind of profound yes, isn't it? it uh, seeing who you are, mm-hmm. seeing the space, the space is yes to everything. Now, Richard says no to a lot of things, and yes to some. So my uh, what, my kind of uh, learning curve is to uh, identify with the one who says yes to everything. Mm. You know, while sometimes saying no to things, you know, you, you need to say no to some things. So it's not a panacea. It doesn't get rid of stress, but it places it. And um, in some at some points, it, I think this is actually a, a part of the whole process. Is that when you awaken to who you are, as you were saying, I think, you go through rhythms. You, you remember and forget. And you have a creative flair and then it goes. And you have uh, a deep acceptance of things and then it goes. And then there's a deeper acceptance that it comes and goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's a long-term deepening, maturing at the human level is this recognition of the wisdom and power and uh, love of your true self uh, that the human kind of staggers around the edge <laughs> yeah i think it's i think cyclical patterns are natural to the universe and to life and to development and so on there's a analogy they use in india where if they want to dye a cloth a certain color dip it in the dye and then bleach it in the sun and it loses most of the color, but a little bit remains. And then dip it again, bleach it again, dip it again, bleach it again. And as you continue that process, eventually it's fully colored, whether it's in the sun or in the vat of dye. You don't need to put it in the dye anymore. Very good image, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another section I wrote down when I was reading your book, you are talking about preferences and resistance versus no preferences and yielding. True self accepts things as they are. Individual self sometimes resists. Trusting the one. And then I, I added, everything God does is for the best. You want to riff on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I think, again, it is uh, the, the two-way thing where you, you place things. 
uh, things are peripheral and uh, nothingness is central, is one way of putting it. And if I uh, look at my hand, my hand is there and I'm space for my hand. And then I'm aware of the sensations and I'm sensations there and no sensations here. I'm capacity for the sensations in my hand. Now if I make my hand into a fist, the hand gets tense but the space doesn't. Mm -hmm. It, uh, and now I relax and the hand gets relaxed, the space doesn't do anything. So if I put my hands to, you know, together I, and push, they resist each other. And then you stop and they stop. Things resist or you know, give way. But the nothingness is just capacity for that whole process. Mm. And so uh, in my feelings and reactions in my body, in my life, I say yes and no. I resist and I surrender. There's a rhythm. But this one here says yes to everything. Mm. And this is who I really am. So it's not just a kind of intellectual thought. It's a, uh, But I think uh, you have to live this. It's, it, just to have it as a nice idea it doesn't do anyone any good, really. Um, but uh, so uh, as we go on, I, I think you kind of at deeper and deeper levels with this kind of rhythm and everyone being different, you say yes at deeper and deeper levels to the one who always says yes. But, you know, with many backslidings. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting theme, really. I mean, you, you're probably familiar with Byron Katie and her, her book, Loving What Is. And uh, I heard on some of your recordings, uh, maybe it was even Douglas I was listening to, about, um, you know, arguing with reality, you know, or, or kind of resisting, you know, not accepting reality as it is. And so that's kind of a popular spiritual meme. A lot of people are, try to make that into a practice. Um, but, you know, sometimes things need to be resisted or you need, you need to say no and so on. And, and so if you take this to heart superficially, you may end up just becoming a, a kind of a pushover. Um, yeah. You know, so there, and, and so I think you just drew a nice distinction, which is that you know resistance is natural and maybe totally appropriate in uh, the relative world, but that which is the space for the relative world, which contains it, uh, you know, is well. You said it says yeah. yes. I mean, yes is is kind of a also a polarity, isn't it? I mean, it's yes, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I the, because I think that. I, um, I think that's all true, and this placing of things is the, the, um, the kind of basic freedom. It's not in learning to be surrendered all the time. Uh, that doesn't, that's, doesn't work, it's not true. Uh, you're misplacing where the surrender is. Mm. Uh, but the basic uh, place that seeing who I really am leads me to is this awareness of who I really am. Mm -hmm. and this uh, miracle that I am. Uh, I, I'm not sure what I am, but it's just incontrovertible in my own experience that I am. I am. Mm -hmm. And the alternative is not being. And it's unimaginable, but I have obviously chosen to be. Here, here I am. And uh, Douglas used to call it, this is the joy without a shadow. Because this basic being, it's outside time, it, it, it is impossible, it is miraculous, it is wonderful. There's no downside to it. it, it it's not got a shadow. Now everything within it has a light and shadow. Now, the, but the basic fact, experience of being, for nothing for something, you know, uh, is... Uh, not uh, not got a shadow. Now, when you kind of get that, as it were, you ha have woken to this joy uh, that has no shadow. Now, it, you know, you, it's not like you're on a high. It's a, a neutral kind of thing in the background, you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, and you might feel very sad some days about things, you know, I do. But gosh, it's like, the other, another connected with another thing. When you wake up to who you are, you find a basic confidence. It's not personal. It, it's the confidence of the one, and that is just doesn't have a downside, really. I mean, you've achieved being. It's for testing. But 
uh, it's like, you know, uh, uh, all the realizations in the world, if they're not backed by the fact that you weren't born and won't die, are, are kind of temporary. But this discovery that you're never born and you'll never die, you know, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Keep the rest. You know. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, it's outrageous. This is your eternal home. It's uh, this. What's arising in it now? This conversation, which coming, coming and going, is arising within this unchanging brilliance, really. And, so, uh, and we're celebrating it, and it's got it together to celebrate it mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually huge. I mean, when you consider how one's perspective must be, if you think that this is all you are, and as soon as this dies, I'm out of here. I, I, I've been snuffed out like a candle, and I, I shall no longer exist in any way, shape, or form. There must be a tremendous amount of fear attending that, that perspective. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and this is such a relaxation and a confidence, I think is the word you just used, oh. wh when you kind of realize viscerally, experientially, that, you know, you're, you're in, actually indestructible. I know. And what a great thing to share. I, I yeah. mean, uh, uh, you know, we're sharing the same, you know, with a different tone of voice. We're sharing mm. the same fact. I mean, we're celebrating what uh, all great, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven, the whatever you want to call it. Mm. You know. It's astonishing, astonishing. Yeah. Um, are there any other exercises you want to demonstrate while we've got you live? Uh, or should they just look them up on your website? And... Oh, well, there's lots on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a bunch in the book. Yes, yes. And uh, I'll I just show this model again because it's such a... Um, we, we, we've just uh, reproduced it. Uh, mm -hmm. Douglas did a version in the... 70s, which was black and white, and we've, we've redone it recently. Is it and something the, one can actually purchase? One, a yes, on oh, the website. Okay. Oh, yes. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yes. Nice. And there's a, an hour-long CD that comes with it. That oh, Doug's nice. Recorded in the yeah. 70s. Make a nice uh, conversation piece on one's oh, coffee, it's coffee table or something. Oh, yes. I mean, it, I just wanted to point out one thing, really. I mean, I pointed out that this shows the different layers of your body, which mm -hmm. is the view in. See. Uh, and but there's uh, pictures on the insides, which is your view out at different ranges. Ah. And so uh, you know this range a few feet. Uh -huh. You see Richard, right. and I Rick, you see. But the view out from the center is of other people, mm -hmm. and of course your face in the mirror at that rate. <laughs> right? yeah. And then so your view from thousands of miles is the uh, view of you is the planet. Mm -hmm. You when you look out. You don't see Earth's face, you see the other planets. Right. Yeah? And the same at the, you know, the star level. You really are a star at a certain range. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably, if you think about it, if, you know, from the other point stars, be, you're, you're probably being observed in the night sky. You might have a name. Yeah. Now, when you look out, you don't see your star face. You trade your star face for mm -hmm. all the other star faces. Right. And so this is a, I mean, the world hasn't woken up to this beautiful vision of, you know, this is, every layer is a subject at school. This shows how they all come together. Mm. This shows how the whole thing is one living system. And one way of thinking about it is the view in is your body at different ranges, and the view out is your mind. Now this integrates your mind and your body you know, with the central core. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of flag that up because it is, it is a breakthrough, really, in yeah. terms of integrating everything. It's really cool, and you know, the the Gita talks about seeing all, seeing the self in all beings, and seeing all beings in the self, and that's that's really very literal. I mean, you know, you, when you get right down to it, you and I are the same thing, you know, and yeah. we're just different manifestations of it, uh, di know, different and expressions of it. it. Yeah. We're being, we're conscious of it now. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that, I don't think it gets any wilder, really. You know, and just, yeah. What a joy. So, I mean, by the same token, you know, 
that which I am is the self of the sun. It's the self of the galaxy. Yeah. It's the it's the you know it's the central core or the foundation of the universe. Wh wherever you want to take it, it's the it's the it's the intelligence governing the functioning of a, one of my brain cells, you know, or one of my blood cells, and so on. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. It's a living universe. Mm. It's a living universe. Yes. It's a beautiful know, perspective. Uh, yes, we we. Uh, we haven't yet realized what what uh, what Douglas uh, has given us in in, in his uh, rediscovery of the living universe uh, it's just a, such an incredible place and we're kind of we're missing it most of the time but it's coming it's mm. coming it, yes. well it's uh it's really great that you've kind of made it your life's work in a sense to propagate Douglas's teaching and uh, I'm sure it's just a labor of love and that you know you don't consider yeah. yourself some kind of her hero for doing it or anything but you know it's great that you are doing it yes I, I'll just say briefly one thing about that is I think as you do these things you have to work out at some point why you're doing it yeah and what you're doing you know and uh, you know for example at, at one point I realized oh what on earth am I what am I trying to do here you know what am I trying to share and then I, for myself, worked out, well, I can't show anyone else my no-head, right? Everyone sees my head. All right, so give up that one, right? <laughs> Stop trying to prove it. Um, so uh, if I, I'm the only one that can see my no-head, what am I trying to share with you, right? Well, I can't prove it to you, but I profoundly accept you can't see your head. So uh, this has now turned from being me trying to tell you what's what to us having an equal conversation about a basic experience. Yeah. And so then going around doing workshops changes from trying to get people to think the same way as you to enjoying making friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in terms of going around, you know, I'm enjoying making friends who help me be mindful. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, and it, of course, we're talking about an experience here and, 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 you know, not just a belief or an understanding or a philosophical concept or something, none of which does anybody a huge amount of good. Uh, they're nice, but they're just icing on the cake. We're talking about an experience. And it's like anything else. I mean, if, if you're enjoying a mango, and you, you could just spend hours describing to me how enjoyable it is, but that's not going to be much of anything for me as compared with actually eating it myself, eating one myself. And so you're, yeah. kind of, you're just kind of going around making, showing people how to eat mangoes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and it is very uh, beautiful because uh, the, the hallmark of a workshop is basically everyone gets it. Yeah. Everyone gets it. Now, what they make of it is different. But uh, it is uh, a, a, the experiments approach 100% efficiency. It is staggering. I mean, it's astonishing. It's not saying, you know, you guarantee any people will carry on with it. But the experience is you just can't argue with it. You can't, you know, your hands disappear, whatever you make of it. Yeah. And so it, it, it really is not a talk shop, a workshop. It's a, you know, so if you can, kind of thing. yes, in the first minute you share it and then you explore it. Yeah. yeah, I think you do mention that, you know, just reading the book doesn't usually do it for people. It, it, there is a value in sort of having friends to do it with and to work with. Um, so people, yes. might, people might want to keep that in mind. And drop in on the free Skype meetings and do the experiments on the uh, website, watch the videos. Like yeah. Nash. Yeah, there's an awful lot. If you want to make friends who value this, they're, they're there. Yes. Yeah. So let's go through some of that. So you have Skype meetings, what, weekly or something? Or? We have four a week. Four hosted, a week, wow. Yeah, hosted by different people. And uh, how does that work? Because you have Skype set up so that 50 people can get on at once or something? Or? Oh, no. Uh, they're, uh, currently, they're small. You uh -huh. know, they're like five, six, eight, okay. four people. Um, and we have a different, well, I think I host two of them at the moment, but mm -hmm. uh, you just uh, make contact with the person hosting and uh, let them know you want to join and they'll invite you in that day. You know, there's no commitment. Okay. The details are on the website under the workshop menu. Okay, and I'll be, and the website is? 
headless.org. Headless.org. And I'll be linking to that as usual. And then uh, what else is there? There's all kinds of exercises on the website. Yes, lots of videos. Uh, we have a, a yearly summer gathering in Salisbury where people come for four or five days, beautiful place. And again, it's very, de it's democratic, non-hierarchical. We do the experiments, we hang out, we make friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I set up the Sholland Trust about 20 years ago, which is non-profit, which is what hosts uh, the website. We publish a lot of the books by Douglas and e-books and, and things. And so people uh, through the website, if these days, if they want to find out about the headless way, they get in touch with me. Okay. And so, which I love. And uh -huh. all, you know, every day people are e e emailing me and, uh, and so on. So I'm very happy to be in touch with people genuinely interested in this. But the thing is that immediately we, you can be in touch with others and have a circle of headless friends. <laughs> <laughs> Henry VIII would have loved this. I know. <laughs> yes. Um, Every so often we have uh, spreecasts, which are advertised on the website. They're free as well. What's a spreecast? Uh, it's a bit like Skype, except the, it's usually me and someone else on the screen, and then the rest are watching, and there's a free chat. Okay. And you can write in, you know, chat, uh, type in questions and comments. Yeah. So, so I, get, I get the impression there's not a whole lot of money involved in this. I mean, there's a lot of things that are for free. Um, you're obviously, yes. if you go and give a workshop someplace, I'm sure there's there's a cost. Yeah, but there's a cost because you've you know, got to pay for what, your travel, travel, travel and yes. the renting a room and all that. But um, but it you know definitely doesn't seem to be some kind of get rich quick scheme for <laughs> for Richard Lang. <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean I came across this when I was 17 mm -hmm. uh, and then I used to visit Douglas a lot and whenever I was there there'd be 10 12 other people so in effect I grew up in a headless community mm -hmm. uh, a, a loose-knit group of friends who valued this it, a, it would be absolutely ridiculous to claim you would got something they didn't have right uh, and B Douglas didn't make money out of it wasn't it you know the thing is we genuinely want to get this out in the world now, of course, we've got to charge for things, but we want to make it as available as possible. So, you know, we give a lot out of our hearts because we want to share it. But then you see, uh, Douglas's first book, The Hierarchy, is huge, weighs five kilos. It's, uh, How many pages is it? 700. Wow. Huge pages with drawings yeah. down every single... You can download the PDF. It's a wonderful book. Oh. But anyway, we needed, uh, you know, years ago now, a few years ago, we wanted to change it from the hardback version, you know, the, the original, into a PDF. So I put out a, a request for help, and within a week I had 150 volunteers. Oh. I think that's because we, we give so much away, as much as we can, you get the goods. So people say, oh, well, I'd, you know, some people say, I'd like to help. And that book has now, we're just reaching an amazing point where it will be ready in French. Now that has taken two or three years mm. to translate into French, uh, but that's all been done by and that, and also in Spanish. It's it's going. People do this for free. We couldn't afford you know to pay anyone anyway, mm. but th because I think there's such a kind of you know uh, gratitude really. That that's great. Being found the, the actual goods. Yeah, I try to do that too with this show. It's you know. That yeah. some, some people have told me I should charge for being able to watch them and all, but I really like to make it freely available and people donate and that supports it. And, uh, and they're actually, I also have like a translation team of people who transcribe and one of them is in England and who, who translate into various languages. So if, if anyone listening to this would like to you know, help with that, get, you know, there's a page on my website for volunteer opportunities, and you can see about that. And, and you too, I mean, if, if people want to help you with translation and, and uh, things like that, uh, they can get in touch with you through headless.org. Yes. Yeah. And you're coming to the States for the SAN conference, I take it? Yes, Great. again, yes. I'll be there, yes. I'll see you there. Oh, lovely, yeah. lovely. I and are you doing any workshops or anything in the States while you're here? Uh, uh, just... Uh, I think on the way back, I, I've been doing them in the Philadelphia area, Levittown, okay. and so I'll, with a um, good friend there, good. and uh, so I'll probably do do them again uh, in that area in October. Good. So 
that will be on the website. And if Have people watching to... this want you to come someplace and, and yeah, do... just get in touch and say, you know, we'd like you to come and I'll come. Great, yeah. fantastic. Okay, uh, is there anything else that we should let people know before we conclude? Well, I just want to thank you again, Rick. I've been delighted to hang out with you. And oh yeah, it's great fun. Yeah, really. It, it it's deep and it's light and it's touching and it's amusing and it's and I hope we you know I'm sure we will reach more people through this. So yeah. Thank, so some people say they get thousands of inquiries when when they do one of these interviews. So we'll see how oh, it goes. But uh, let, yeah. let's see if we can beat the record. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Everybody email Richard. <laughs> well, in, back in the 70s, Douglas, uh, do, do you hear, have you heard of Werner Erhardt? And oh, yeah, Oscar? of course. Sure. All right, so Werner Erhardt became friends with Douglas and mm -hmm. really appreciated uh, The Headless Way. I put a, a film of a meeting uh, that Douglas did with um, Werner Erhardt's trainers. This yeah. was in the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, Douglas was invited by Werner Hart to do one of the big tours. I think several other people have done it. And, you know, about six cities in the States and London. And in Denver, there were 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, uh, Douglas decided to get that hierarchy reprinted, uh, the little version. You know, it was out of print because uh, he was sure he was going to be flooded with inquiries. Mm -hmm. And, and he, so he went round and there's... Um, a, he made a, a particular kind of uh, toolkit for you know, with a tube where you notice your face and no face, right. and this card uh, where you put, you put this on and you yeah. guide your attention to the nothingness. So, so he he did this six week tour, whatever it was, and, and shared it with thousand, and was preparing when he got home for being deluged. Uh -huh. I think he got one letter. Oh, brother! <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's yeah. not necessarily a bad thing, you know. Yeah. So, we don't need to contact them. Really. Well, the bat, the bat gap crowd tends to be a bit more um, responsive. Responsive, yeah. So let's see what happens. But uh, in any case, thanks. Uh, really appreciated being able to meet with you. Doing these interviews is the highlight of my week, and uh, it's always enjoyable to spend time with someone like you. Um, well, I look so, forward to seeing you in California. Richard. Yeah, I'll we'll see you out there in October. Thank you. Sure. So before you d disconnect, let me just make a few concluding remarks. Um, for those watching, you've been watching, or perhaps if you're listening on, an, on a podcast, you've been listening to uh, an interview with Richard Lang. And these, I do one of these interviews just about every week. There are, I think Richard is number 236 or something. So there's a whole archive of them that you can access uh, on batgap.com. And you'll find them uh, indexed there alphabetically, chronologically, and even by topic uh, or by you know, category. And uh, if you go there and poke around, you'll also find a few other things. You'll find a, a list of upcoming interviews, a place to suggest people to be interviewed, a donate button, as I mentioned earlier, which I rely on people clicking uh, in order to do this, um, a place to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted, a link to the audio podcast so you can subscribe on iTunes, a forum or a discussion group where people you know chat about each particular interview each one has its own section and a bunch of other things if you poke around i mentioned there's a volunteer page so go there batgap.com uh, richards will have his own page there with link a link to his website a bio links to his books and links also to douglas harding's books like the one we've been mentioning uh, hierarchy of heaven and earth so thank you for listening or watching, and thank you again, Richard, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.